Hello and welcome to a brand new Arse Blog Arsecast, right here on arsblog.com. How are you? Hope you're well. Thank you very much, as always, for being here. Football is not far away. It has felt far away because of the gap between our last game and this one. I'm recording on a Thursday, so it's a good week since we beat Wolves and disgusted the world of football by actually being happy about it. And then there's another day tomorrow, and then there's Saturday, and we're playing Brentford, and that's good. And I'm feeling quite excited and hopeful and optimistic and all of those things. I don't know if that's just a byproduct of not having any football to disappoint you. You start to, you know, think in a more positive, a more optimistic, a more hopeful way. I'm not quite sure. But look, it's a home game. We won our last game. And why shouldn't we feel like we can take three points from this one? So uh, I am looking forward to a bit of football again. I hope you've been uh, passing your time well this week, whatever you've been doing. I've been doing lots of work this week on something um, which will become clear next week. I'll give you more details on that, but doing a lot. And in uh, my very little spare time, walking dogs and listening to an audiobook about uh, the mafia, the Cosa Nostra, that whole world of uh, pretty uh, awful, crazy things. I don't know if you're an audiobook person. I've uh, got into them a bit in the last couple of years. I never thought I would be, but by the time I go to bed these days, I'm so tired, I get about two pages into a book and go, and just fast asleep. So I found that audiobooks are a good way, particularly when you've got dogs to walk and you can, uh, you know, take a good stroll, listen to a, a book for an hour. It's it's a good way to, to get a book into you. Not fiction. I haven't been able to do fiction yet, but a lot of non-fiction stuff, which is which is quite interesting. Um, but I do have this, this issue with it, as uh, you may or may not know. I'm a bit of a stickler for sound and sound quality, and a lot of these audiobooks have things which make me go, oh, how did that get through the production process? It's where at some point they've gone back to add a line after the main recording has been done. I'll give you an example of what it sounds like uh, with the closest book to hand, which actually happens to be uh, James's book, the Champ and the Chump, which is sitting on my desk. Uh, let me open um, the book here at a, a certain point and see. Okay, here's, here's, here's what it sounds like when they do this in an audiobook. And of course, this is me if I was reading James's book, not me doing an impression of James reading James's book. In 2004, inspired by the achievements of Arsenal's legendary Invincibles, I started a website called Gunner Blog. For the best part of a decade, I recorded my observations about the team on an almost daily basis. I earned almost nothing from the site in this period, but I enjoyed the exercise and catharsis of writing. People who don't know me are often quite surprised I'm into football, and I get it. Again, let me make it clear, I'm not saying this is an issue with James's audiobook, but with audiobooks in general. And I just want you to know that if you're out there, and you listen to audiobooks, and this bugs the absolute shit out of you too, just know you're not alone. You're not alone. Right, let's get on with the show. In a while, I'm going to be talking to Matt Spiro. We're going to have a halftime report, halftime, half-season report on William Saliba, who is doing good things at Marseille. So we're going to get some insight from Matt into William Saliba. But you would have seen this week a lot of talk about a fans forum meeting. Vin, I talked about the planned improvements for the Emirates Stadium and much more besides. But what is the fans forum? Who's on it? How do the meetings work? And what do they talk about? With me to discuss that is Peter Hust. Hello, Peter. Hello, Andrew. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. Just give us a quick outline as to why you are involved in the, in the Arsenal Fans Forum um, and, and what exactly uh, this group does. Arsenal has a Fans Forum, and I believe so has all the other Premier League clubs. They are obliged to have some sort of engagement with fans and consulting with different ideas. And um, this is my third season on, and I uh, I applied to be on back when that was how you did it. Mm. And the club chose who could represent different groups because we are a group of uh, around 15 different reps from different fan groups, and uh, I represent international fans. So that is maybe a couple of millions, what would you say? Yeah, just so a few. A good thing <laughs> representing them so that's easy but uh, then the club has um, 10 or 12 different reps as well so it's actually it seems like the club is prioritizing it 
quite a bit because Vinay is always on, and Mark Brindle is always on, Mark Gonella is always on, and then uh, the new uh, CCO, Juliet Slot, and and a couple and a couple of others, Tom McCann, who is head of the venue, and, and, and others. So different reps from different fan groups and different um, employees from Arsenal meet. Okay, so just to put that in perspective, I mean, people will know who Vinay is. Mark Gunnell is the head of communications. Mark Brindle yes. is the... Um, uh, liaison the, officer? Yeah, the, the fan liaison officer and, and people like that. So what is the format of one of these meetings? You know, you guys, and, and I, I guess there'll be people from... Um, you know, other people, there'd be young supporters, you're representing international supporters, uh, disabled supporters, uh, there's an AST member, L- LGBT plus uh, member, et cetera, et cetera. So it's trying to um, uh, represent a, a vast, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? It's, it's, it's trying to represent as many fans as possible in these meetings. So everybody has a, a chance to get their point across. What is the format of the meetings? Obviously, they're virtual at the moment because of Zoom. Yes. And, and when you're international, everything, you know, they're probably going to be virtual anyway. But but what, what happens in these meetings? How are the subjects raised? Are there pre-submitted questions, etc.? Yes. Well, at uh, at every meeting, it uh, usually starts with uh, Vinay giving a, what did you say, State of the Union speech, okay. a general update on what has been going on since the last meeting. And uh, it's both on and off the pitch matters. And, and then a couple of other subjects, um, there is a talk ongoing about what has happened to the things we discussed, discussed last time. I think... If, through all the three years I've been there, it has almost at every meeting been some sort of talk about safe standing. Uh, so, so that's an ongoing discussion, and there's always some things about what what is the match day experience and how can we improve that, and mm. uh, small things and uh, and that. I think I will. I went to London two times. I, I've been there for two meetings. Usually, it. It is uh, at Highbury House, the the place where most of the Arsenal employees have their office. And uh, since the pandemic, uh, it has been virtual meetings. So that is, of course, a lot easier. But there is definitely something missing when you when you have a, a virtual meeting instead of sitting down yeah. next to each other. But uh, I think a lot of people have experienced that and uh, virtual meetings are easy to to go to but uh, they are not as um what would you say effective yeah. in all matters it, it's it, you know what i mean yeah but but uh, we meet and 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 after this uh, general update from vinai and and a couple of other things uh, uh tom about the venue is updating what is going on with the work uh, about about safe standings for instance then there is um a, a q and a session so all the reps have the opportunity to send in questions and Arsenal are preparing answers so that it, they know in advance what we're going to ask them generally mm. and they have prepared some, some answers for that. So there's usually a long agenda. I believe the last one here is a six, six pages Word document with a lot of different questions from a lot of different reps. And of course, we have different areas we are specifically uh, interested mm. in. And uh, if you are representing uh, 16 to 21 year olds, it's 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 that area that you usually ask questions about. And if you are in the family enclosure, you are worried more about yeah. issues there. Let me ask you, I mean, as the, the representative for international fans, the, the handful of international fans that Arsenal have, of course, um, how, what are the kind of issues that, that you've brought up and how, um, you know, given that there are quite a number of international fans, how do you manage to try and represent the interests or the questions or the queries of those fans, is there a, a feedback process that they can get in touch with you and say, "Look, this is we we would like to know about this. We'd like to know about that." And what are the the particular issues, or maybe some of the ongoing issues that that international fans have? That's a very good question, because there are so many different aspects. I, I don't know even where to begin. But it, the, the 
practical part of it is that if you dig through uh, the corners of uh, Arsenal's web page, there is an area dedicated to the supporters forum, as it used to be called. And there is the opportunity to contact your rep. Your rep. So mm. uh, once in a while, I receive an email from someone in India who has this idea about this or that. And could you please make them do this or that? And uh, <laughs> a couple of weeks ago uh, just before the window ended could you please ask them to sign this or that player <laughs> yeah. because that would be great yeah. so of course that's what i'm doing yeah, yeah. well um i don't have any specific areas because as an international fans I, uh, rep i i don't represent people going every week for most international fans they don't go to the emirates mm. or travel once or twice in their lifetime so it's a different experience being an overseas international international Arsenal fan. Mm. So of course it's it's other areas, but I have tried to reach out and and ask uh, in in different uh, circles what would people think are the most interesting issues. But I I tend to not get many reactions at all. Right. But 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 the general uh, concern is that we want Arsenal to be as focused on international fans as they are fans in Islington. Sure. What What is your sense, having done this for three years, of its effectiveness as a, as a group, as an organisation, not just, you know, I, I shouldn't say as an organisation, I should say as a thing, the Arsenal Fan Forum, not just from the fans' perspective, but from the club's perspective as well, in terms of... Like, I know the club have got people who are well aware of how fans are feeling. They can gauge the mood. They can take the temperature via social media if they want, which isn't always reflective of, of how fans are thinking. There are, you know, extremes at both ends, of course. But, True. but you know, based on some of the issues that you've seen raised, not just by yourself, but by other members, and how they've been acted on or not acted on... Um, uh, how effective do you think this is as a as a tool for the fans and for the club to maintain these lines of communication, which I think are are really really important. You know, the club needs to know what fans think about all the various things that they do, and they need to the 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 fans need to know what the club think about what they think. If you know what I mean, like how is that feedback process working? I, I think I'll start out, out by saying that there are no. A uh, unified Arsenal fan attitude towards any single subject. Yeah, you could put fifteen Arsenal fans together in a room, and they would be able to disagree on almost anything. So it's I see from a cup from a club perspective, it's difficult to please us. Mm-hmm. But I think the dialogue and prioritizing listening and as answering question is important in itself. And there's always an ongoing discussion about why don't you just live stream it why don't you just make it open for everyone and i i see that and i hear that but there is something about having a closed room where you can talk about certain topics and and get feedback and they also know that we are not in in ourselves representative of all arsenal fans but it's it's an image together with all the other different images they get from other places as you described so, so I think that Arsenal are prioritizing this much more than they have to. And I think it is because they know it is important to give something a, an opportunity for fans to be heard. And, mm. and it's a drop in the ocean because fans are never satisfied on that account. Yeah, and that's not just true of, of Arsenal fans. I think it's true of football fans in, in general. Um, you have had some experience with Josh Kroenke as well at these meetings. Yes. He's He's been there, and not least after the Super League debacle, I think we can call it, where Arsenal were in and then they were out. And um, there's an interview with him uh, doing the rounds this week. I might ask you a little bit about that in, in a while. Um, but as the the Cronky who is going to be at these meetings, never going to be Stan, it's always going to be Josh. How have you found his participation in, in these meetings? Well, I, th- I think it's... Um it's difficult to describe him because he is in many ways so different from you and I. 
I mean, he has this whole different background. He has grown up in the Kroenke family, always very privileged in many ways. And and he has played basketball. He has, uh, <clears throat> he has grown up knowing all these different kinds of sports. And um, I think he is genuinely interested in seeing Arsenal being successful. I think the main stumbling block is how much he understands the football culture in Europe. Mm. You you referenced the interview, and I noticed that he is beginning to to insist on calling it football, and, uh, and I think that's a step in the right direction. But there, there's a long way to go. Sure. And I think he, as you have said yourself many times, talks a good game, but I think that it's over the next couple of years we will see his actions. Uh, if they back up his words. Yeah, I think that's fair. And, and the interview, which I linked to on Ars blog this week, and um, people can go and find it. There's a big picture of uh, Josh with his beard on the post in question, so it's not too difficult to, to, to find uh, on the site. You know, he does talk well, and he talks about the passion of fans and how important it is and the lessons that they learned from the, from the Super League thing and all of that kind of stuff. And down the years, we've had some issues with KSE as owners, um, where we have felt like at times perhaps the 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 direction hasn't come right from the very top. They've been hands off, which when Arsene Wenger was there and Stan Kroenke came in, I don't think anyone had any problem with that because it was like, well, who do we want to run the club? The guy who's won us lots of titles or, you know, Stan Kroenke who doesn't know anything about football. But there is a, a time where... I think that some direction as to where you're going as a football club has to come from the very top. That ambition has to be more than just a couple of lines about how you want to win trophies and how you want to compete for the biggest trophies. Anyone can say that. Anyone can put that in a share document, an offer document, uh, but you've got to back it up with what you do. So I, I, I remain on this side of the cynical line a little bit, but at the very least... There is um, greater communication, more involvement, yes. and certainly a willingness to learn about the responsibilities they have as owners, not just um, to themselves, but to the football club itself and how it's run. I think at times they've been too hands-off, and some of that um, hands-offness has um, has backfired on them a bit. So let's let's see what happens with, with Josh. And, um, yeah, go. And, and you can say that... If you have the right people running the club on a daily basis, that approach might work for some time. Mm. But, but I don't think that in the long run it is sustainable. So, so I think Josh being over there more and, and the things he has learned after the whole Super League thing, I think is moving in a more proactive direction. Mm. And, I, and I think it's all also worth worth stressing that after the Super League, Arsenal have tried to um, change fan engagement a bit. Um, the advisory board has uh, been arranged and, and they met last week and, um, and that, uh, Josh was there and he's there uh, along with Tim Lewis, the lawyer and a board member mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and representatives from different fan groups. So it's also this process of finding out what do the advisory board do uh, compared to the fans forum, because yeah. they are two separate things, but somehow it's still the same. Uh, after the Super League, Joss attended the fans forum a couple of times, and, and we have been discussing things with him, but now it seems like although he has dedicated himself to attend at least one fans forum a year, it's his focus is on meeting with the advisory board. Right. So that that is also something that I think, I hope Arsenal are going to um, give that some more light because I think that could potentially be a very good thing. But as of now, it's still finding its feet and they don't know how to do it. And well, mm. well things to, to, to follow up on. Sure. I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, we'll have to, I guess, wait and see how it plays out. And that's a fairly new organization, the advisory board. And uh, again, it represents 
um, a, a cross section of fans. I think it probably could be a bit more diverse and a bit more representative. But over Absolutely. time, over time, hopefully that happens. And and yeah, let's hope it doesn't necessarily dilute or become diluted uh, by the um, by the fans forum and the advisory board. Like, does it become a mesh of something, or do they become very specific about how they deal with with certain issues? Speaking of certain issues, at the at the most recent meeting, there was a um, Vin. I gave some uh, information about the stadium and some of the work um, that is being planned for the stadium. Now, was that? Um, I know for a fact that that people have raised concerns um, to Vinay directly over the stadium and its upkeep and all of that kind of stuff. Because at the end of the day, we want to see money invested in the team. We want to see the best players. We want to see a great team on the pitch. But at the same time, the the stadium is our home and we need to be proud of our home and its surroundings and the way it looks and the way things work or don't, you know. So what was the um, process for him giving that update on the stadium? Because um, was that a question that was raised or is this this was part of his initial address? Yes, it was part of the pre-prepared presentation because Mm. it's a work in progress, ongoing work about uh, getting new screens and, and, and stuff like that. And 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 this is a, a great example of uh, an issue where Arsenal fans will uh, absolutely disagree because should we invest a lot of money in upgrading the seats? Should we get the safe standing? Should we get the new screens? Or should we buy the striker we need? I know it's not a one-to-one comparison, but yeah. you, you know what I mean. It, it's you can't agree with everyone about how to prioritize this because do you want to invest all the money available in in the first team squad or, or do you want the facilities to improve as well so so i think what they are doing is necessary and some of the things should have been dealt with years ago but it's good that they're doing it and i think it's only something that we can uh, back back up yeah, I mean, look, there is certain work that needs to be done. The roof is leaky. You can't, you can't have that. Andrew Allen did a good piece over on Ars Blog News where he's talking about the various things, uh, the roof, exterior crests, uh, and the player wrap, uh, big screens, uh, beer inside, ticket readers, the PA system. <laughs> uh, mobile connectivity. There's all kinds of things which, um, you know people are looking for and and need to get done, you know. Um, and I don't think the two have to be mutually exclusive, as you say. The um, the ability to buy our first-choice striker, I don't think will be impacted by whatever renovations we need to do to a stadium. And that's the reality of any football stadium. It looks shiny and lovely when you, when you build it first, but wear and tear and weather and all of that kind of stuff plays a part. So you have to pay some attention to it. Yeah, and, and maintenance is important. And you would be surprised uh, the amount they mention about what it costs just to improve the science in the stadium. Mm. Because many seats are almost without numbers, so it's difficult to find out which seat to sit in. And, and, and just to take care of those, those small issues, well... Yeah. Good luck with that, Tom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And look, keep bringing up the safe standing thing because that is something that I would love to see uh, at yeah. the Emirates. I know that yeah. they've they've committed to talking about thinking about having a discussion about maybe yes. at some point down the line considering a discussion about thinking about it maybe perhaps. That's yes. where we that, are, that's right? That's a, 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 a great way to express it. And, and and it's also a great example because I honestly don't care about it. And every time they talk about safe standing, I mentally check out a little bit because it's been talked to death over the years. But I know it's very important for others, So yeah. but it's just not my thing. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fair enough. Like you say, everyone's got their own opinions on, on yeah. certain uh, subjects and things that they would prioritize over other things. Um. The one other thing I want to ask you about is I I am aware that there has been um, discussions. Is discussions the right word? I, I think yeah. there have been some strident opinions about the use of these fan tokens, uh, socios.com yes. fan tokens, which, you know, I don't even want to go into the whole um the cryptocurrency aspect of it. I'm not here to slate crypto or anything like that, but 
for me, the idea that fan engagement should be monetized in that way, when you're, you know, you can become a member of the club, you, you, if you have decisions, if you have things that you want to put to the fan base, you can engage with way more fans and be way more open with your supporters if you're doing it to more of them and these people don't have to buy cryptocurrency via convoluted methods to buy a token, which then gives you the right to vote on a thing, which is just, you know. So there are obviously financial benefits to the club from socios.com, which Mm -hmm. at a time when finances have been stretched, not just at Arsenal, but across Europe. And we're seeing UEFA sign up with them as well, which, you know, makes me uneasy a little bit too. Um, we, we have to understand that the club are saying, well, this is perhaps a source of revenue that could, I don't know, it could buy four new big screens. Who knows? That's That could be the way that they're looking at it, right? Exactly. But from a fan's perspective, I think it leaves many fans uneasy that in order to have your say on... Now, they're not particularly important club matters. You have to pay to do that. It feels yep. wrong. And particularly, I know Arsenal, um, we like to think uh, Arsenal is a classy club and has that touch of class and everything else. And every fan wants to think that about their own club. But this feels spectacularly on Arsenal to me. So how did that, how did that de- debate, discussion, whatever you want to call it, go down? Oh, that was... Uh, I, I- a heated discussion, it's fair to say. Yeah. And uh, they got some intense feedback from several of the reps on, on the forum. Mm. And and I think you, you mentioned Arsenal, Arsenal values. And, um, and I remember Raul a couple of years ago described Arsenal, Arsenal's values and, um, and he mentioned doing the right thing mm. uh, as, as one of the values uh, or uh, uh, doing it the right way. And and I think we can maybe talk about the partners Arsenal have uh, more broadly because for me socios uh, are terrible and you can say the same about eToro or you could say about sports Betio or Wizard Rwanda to a certain extent and 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 there's this whole package of thing and you notice it every time you get an email from Arsenal all the brands are mentioned below and. I don't think it's right that Arsenal are connected with businesses like uh, Socios or eToro, and especially after the ASA ruling that, uh, I don't know if, if you have talked about that before, but but the ASA ruling uh, decided that Arsenal have had been misleading their fans in investment speculation mm. matters. Yeah. And, and that's that's quite bad, I think. Yeah, but 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 to sum it up, I think they, they got a, a, a massive negative feedback, and and I think my main concern is that they are just defending their stance. They are not trying to uh, say anything about understanding our concerns or uh, stuff like that, because they have this partnership and they defend that. So, well, maybe I could be proven wrong, but I'm I'm concerned that they are not listening to our. A concern. Sure. No, I get you. And look, it's. I think it's one thing to talk uh, and accept feedback about how the stadium paint is getting a bit flaky, and they can get a guy on a ladder to paint it over. But you know, when a some different beer, and yeah, stuff like that. exactly. But when somebody is paying you, or you're generating, I don't know how much they're getting from this partnership. I like. I don't like it either. I agree with you um, for the, about this, but. I would hope, given that it exists, it's worth millions. And it isn't something that is, you know, for all this negativity that surrounds it, isn't generating the kind of money that makes that criticism wor- uh, worth it. You know what I mean? So, mm. yeah. um, but I would prefer, to be perfectly honest, I understand this betting and I understand this cryptocurrency, but I don't think you should be selling tokens to fans to allow them to vote on things you know, when when in reality, if the true uh, rationale for doing something was to engage with fans, you you engage with as many as possible, as freely as possible, to make fans feel as connected to the club as they possibly can. Because there's also a real exclusivity about um, you know about this kind of 
the, these tokens, like most people can't afford them. Most people don't have the technological know-how to know how to go and get them. And the reality as well is that you don't have to be an Arsenal fan to buy one of these tokens and vote on an Arsenal thing. You can get one of these tokens and vote for Lee, vote on Leeds things or Aston Villa things or the UEFA thing or whatever it is. So this is not something that is really, really Arsenal it's a it's a, a trading platform or whatever it is dressed up as something to to extract money from football fans exactly. in a fairly shameless and, way and also there's something about numbers in this because every season ticket holder uh, given one token and mm. i i looked at the, the the number of fan tokens and from this article in the athletic i uh, read a, a joey durso yeah. he has been going into this very much. And uh, he found out that on average, people who own fan tokens own 66. So that means if you and I have one token each, our vote doesn't make much sense compared to the heavy investors. Yeah. Yeah. Who well, aren't, well, uh, who aren't, who aren't uh, investing because they want to vote on football club matters. They're speculating on the ups and downs of a cryptocurrency. We have some very wealthy Spurs fans buying them and making a lot of noise and yeah. all stuff like that. Oh, all well, right. Well, look, let's not go much more into that. Because sure. I'll just be uh, annoyed. Okay. Fair enough. Well, listen, thank you, Peter, for uh, giving us a bit of insight into what happens at these fans forum meetings. Well, can, can I just add one thing uh, sure. here at last? Because uh, uh, at the fans forum, we have, uh, we have made different subgroups, working groups to, to delve into topics. And and I just wanted to give a pitch to one of the topics there because we have made um, a subgroup to work together with the Arsenal Foundation. And this month we are having a raffle, an online raffle where you can you can win quite cool Arsenal prizes. Uh, you can win a match day experience at a director's box or a signed shirt for the men's team or the women's team or mm. a pair's book or stuff like that. So that is some of the things we do. And, and uh, I, I would like to, to just say that although I can sometime come out very critical of some of the things Arsenal do and uh, be against this and that. I also think that it's worth mentioning that the Arsenal Foundation in particular are doing a very good thing, very uh, important stuff, and we would like to support that because that is a place where I see some of the things I think is true Arsenal values. And I would definitely encourage people to support that. Okay. Well, look, uh, we will have a link to the raffle uh, in the show notes yes. for this particular episode. I think the tickets are, what, two pounds, something like two that. So they're not, ex- uh, not particularly expensive. And like you say, some of the prizes are really, really excellent. And I completely am with you 100% on the work that the Arsenal Foundation do. It is incredible uh, in the community and beyond. So uh, well done for that. And Peter, thanks very much for talking to us today. My pleasure. Thank you very much indeed to Peter. You can find him on Twitter at Peter Hust, at Peter Hust. That's Peter H O E. ST. He's also the vice president of Arsenal Denmark. Hope you enjoyed that. Got some insight into what happens at these fans forum meetings. And obviously the club engages with the various issues in in different ways. Some much more deeply, others on a more uh, superficial basis. But it is what it is. And I hope you found it interesting. There is also in the show notes a link to the raffle that Peter was talking about, which helps raise money for the Arsenal Foundation. And you can win uh, some pretty cool prizes. So have a look. The link is in the show notes or It's on the website uh, for this post on arsblog.com. Okay, now for a bit of insight into a player I think we all are hoping will come back next season and be part of the Arsenal squad and hopefully a big part of our future, William Saliba. There's been so much said about his uh, Arsenal career today, but we're going to focus on what he's done during his loan spell at Marseille and who better to talk to about that than Matt Spiro. Hello, Matt. Hi, Andrew. How's it going? It is going all right. William Saliba, it's a big story. There's, you could practically write a book on him at this point, given what's happened, the amazing transfer, the fact that he came to Arsenal, he was loaned out, he came back, he was loaned out again, and he's on loan at Marseille this season. And we're all very interested in how he's progressing and and what the future might hold for him, particularly from an Arsenal perspective. But we're sort of a little over the halfway point in the Liga season. Marseille are basically the best of the rest with PSG out in front. And he's played 
pretty regularly for them, 2,070 minutes, 23 of 24 uh, league games. How has it been going for him? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, Saliba? I wonder if there's a player who uh, who has not played a single game for Arsenal has been talked about as much as, as, as mm. William Saliba. Um, you're right, he's played a lot. He's actually played more minutes than any other Marseille player. Um, he, he's having a really, really strong season. Um, he's just been voted uh, Player of the Month, Marseille Player of the Month for, for January. Um, some really, really strong performances. There's been the odd game where he where he struggled uh, recently. Uh, Marseille lost in the French Cup to Nice. They got they got badly beaten four one. And um, Sam Pauli, who's a bit of a an eccentric coach and chops and changes his tactics a lot. He he played a team that no one really understood, where he played effectively four centre backs with uh, Saliba playing as a right back, um, and and he did struggle, even though. You know he's been playing on the right side of, uh, of of a back three most of the season. Um, he had a bad game. Marseille had a had a bad game. They lost four one. But yeah, all in all, you know, he's been absolutely, you know, a rock at at, at the back for Marseille. He's he's the go to man in defence. Uh, a lot of the other guys have been sort of in and out of the team. He's the one guy who gets picked every single game, mm. be it be it in the European competitions, the French Cup, the league. Um, and Marseille fans absolutely, absolutely love him. So, you know, I'm going to be hugely, hugely positive about, about what I've seen from William Saliba. Um, there was a game that I was at in Lens where, where Marseille won 2-0 in Lens, which is a, a great result. And uh, at times in that game, it, it felt a little bit like I was watching kind of a man against boys. And I know that's a bit weird to say for a 20-year-old, mm. but it, he, was, he was just immense. And um, he's, he's got speed, he's got power and... When he's playing well, which, like I say, has been ninety-five percent of the time, he's he's a really impressive defender. What is the the key strength or key strengths that you see from him as a defender? Because I've been looking at his stats, and and clearly there's um, a lot of focus on what he does on the ball. Uh, he, he seems to be a, um, a good ball carrier. He passes it well. I was interested to note the long pass statistics. This is via FB Ref. Um, so based on this season alone, he's attempted 247 long passes and completed 83% of them. And just to give people an idea, long pass is categorized as a pass over 30 yards. Uh, at Arsenal, Ben White and Gabriel uh, have attempted 199 and 196, respectively, so very much in the same ballpark as each other. Their pass completion rates for their long pass is Ben White, 63%, and Gabriel, 67%. Now, I know there might be some other factors involved in that, like there might be players at Marseille who are, let's say, more of an outlet up front for a long pass than some of the players that Arsenal have. But this in particular appears to be a real uh, strength to Saliba's game. Yeah, he's he's good. Absolutely, he's good on the ball. Um, he, he uses the ball well, and he does try to play passes that 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 break the lines. I watch, you know, I watch a lot of Saliba, and I watch a lot of Arsenal, as you know. And I, yeah. I, I try to work out why Arsenal spent big on 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 Ben White rather than play William Saliba. Um, and it is it it is difficult to understand. I would I'd, I'd say that Ben White. You know, is probably well. I I think he's better on the ball than Saliba. I think Saliba is um, he's 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 a good passer, but if he's sort of hurried and in a, in a tight space, he doesn't quite have the the the, the ball skills and the composure of Ben White. Mm. Um, and I would say if Ben White's percentage is is lower than Saliba, it's probably because he's trying harder passes. Um, but you know, but but that said, he is definitely you know Saliba is definitely above average in terms of the the use of the ball and his and his distribution, and it's good. And he's not afraid. I've always said he's not afraid to sort of step forward into the midfield. Marseille play with with three at the back. They have very flexible sort of formations, and Saliba can can spend time in the midfield. You know, he'll step up, and sometimes he'll carry on up 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 the right wing, and he's not. You know he's not a fish out of water when he's when he's in the um, the opposition third. So 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 he's good. But I mean, if you want to ask me what are his sort of exceptional attributes as far as Marseille and the way they play is concerned, they try to play very high up the pitch, and Saliba you know enables them to do that because he has got he has got real speed, particularly 
over longer distances. So, you know, if 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 there's a ball over the top and he has to run back 10, mm. 20, 30 yards, you know, he will usually eat up that space and uh, and overtake the attacker. And that 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 kind of enable you know, if Saliba's not there, they can't play on the halfway line or that, you know, they can't play this pressing game very, very high up the pitch. And that and that is why I think Sam Paoli uses him in every single game because the other centre backs are not as quick as him. So it's it's his speed, you know, for such a big player. Um, he, he's 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 so sort of athletic, mobile, and quick. the The life of a centre half is an interesting one because it, it takes time to learn the position, and there are things that some defenders are good at naturally, and others have to learn, and and everything else. Um, and I'm curious as to how you view um things like his positioning, his reading of the game, his aerial ability, his his ability to be in the right place when the opposition are attacking. Um, those are things which I think all defenders develop over a period of time. Um, but when I think about him and I think about what we're hopefully going to have from him if and when he comes back to Arsenal, um, are those developing nicely? Are they things that he is naturally good at or are there still uh, things for him to learn in that regard? No, I think... I think it's good. I think it's positive from that point of view, but you're right. I think that's where, um, you know, a young defender does sometimes get caught out and in the handful of mistakes he's made or the handful of goals where you could say, oh, you know, where was where was Saliba there? You know, it probably is a case of the concentration levels perhaps not not quite being where they where they should be. But we're being pretty pretty harsh because like I say you know most of the time he is in the right place he is he, he is where he needs to be um, and I think it depends as well it depends on being comfortable in a system and, and playing with the same players week in week out um, and certainly in the last three or four months when Marseille have um, been extremely solid uh, they've had the the best defensive record in, in the league um, they have had that stability and uh I think Saliba has has good awareness. I think he has he he has good anticipation, and um, you know, I yeah, I, I I wouldn't be that worried. But that is where I think probably the the intensity is different in the Premier League, where it, it is you know much more two teams mm. attacking. Whereas you know a lot of the time at Marseille, Marseille have the ball for for considerable periods, um, and it's more sort of you know he's blocking out those those counter-attacks. So, I, you know, I think definitely the Premier League would throw up different sort of challenges, but they're not things that, that I think would be a problem for Saliba. And I think that, yeah, positionally, he's, he's, he's already pretty strong. What about versatility at the bank? Because as you said, Marseille do change their formation a little bit, do change their setup a little bit. They play with a three. Uh, they played with back four. He's played on the left and right of, of a, a back four as well. So is he... Is he quite versatile in that way? Because you do get defenders who are absolutely wedded to one side of, let's say, the the one side of a back uh, four. You know, the left side or right sided central defender. There's a guy who will play in the middle of a back three. Guy will always play on the right of a back three. Like, would he be comfortable moving around in a back four? Yes. Yes, he's uh, again. You know, I say he's the go to man in in, in defence because he plays every single game. He's also the guy who tends to get pushed about, you know, in, in, into different positions, which suggests that Sam Paoli thinks he is capable of, of, of adapting. There was a game a couple of weeks ago. I, I think it was, it was, they were playing at home to Angers. Mm. Uh, Sam Paoli made a lot of changes. He brought in a center back called Balerdi who hadn't played recent games. And it was interesting because in all the lineups, we had Saliba, you know, as the right sided center back. And actually when the game started, it was Balerdi on the right and Saliba suddenly having, played on the right mm. for, for the last few months was playing on the left and actually he did struggle a bit in the first 15 20 minutes i think just getting his bearings in 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 that new position there are a couple of lost passes Ange scored two in the first 15 20 minutes not all saliba's fault but you know he didn't cover himself in glory in those first 20 minutes um grew and was fine after that and marseille won five two it was actually a really strong strong comeback and and, and strong victory um but Yes, yeah, so, I mean, maybe I'm giving an example where he didn't do so well changing position. But I think the fact that Sam Paoli's played him right back, he's played him on the right side of the three. He has played on, on the left side of a, of a central two as well. So I think there is that versatility, yes. I, I, I think he can do that. 
but I think like anybody probably needs you know he needs that bedding in time as well um do you view this move to Marseille a, a little bit differently now after we've seen uh, half a season a bit more than half a season because I know that when it went down last summer people were a bit angst, uh, antsy about the whole thing because, you know, we bought this player. We've a lot invested in him emotionally. We want him to succeed. He seems like a, a nice lad. He seems like everything you want in a modern central defender in terms of his physique, his ability on the ball, his pace, all the things that you've talked about. There are things that, as Arsenal fans, we've looked at central defenders and wished we had even one or two of those things, and he seems to have it all in one package, right? So when the decision was made very early last summer to to loan him out, there was a lot of, I'm not going to say fury, but, you know, there was it, it created a lot of debate, Right. And there were questions about whether he was going to play for the club again and have we just decided to wash our hands of him and all of that kind of stuff. I have to say, like, over the past six, seven months, my opinion on that has changed a bit because I feel like when we're talking about a defender of his age, who is only 19 or 20, that playing is the single most important thing for him. I mean, we... we, we we're talking about, um, for example, Flo Balagoon as a potential striker for Arsenal in the years to come. But he's going on his first loan move at more or less the same age uh, to Middlesbrough. And we're looking for him to develop there. So similarly, Saliba, I think, is more uh, advanced in his progression and development as a player. But it strikes me that this has been a really good move for him and potentially a really good move for Arsenal as well in that the player is playing, he is developing, his reputation is growing, his confidence is growing, his ability is growing. I realize that comes with other problems, if you like, in that, you know, you 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 open him up to other experiences, which he might decide he, he prefers more than London. But that's a, a bridge you can cross when you come to it. But when they decided to loan him out early, it, it, it seems like they were looking at the summer and thinking, well, we're going to buy Ben White. I think they knew they were going to do that or they were going to try and do that. They still had Rob Holding. They still had Callum Chambers. They still had Pablo Marie in the squad. There were players, I guess, who were going to be ahead of him. So the best thing was to loan him out. And it, it looks like Arsenal have now streamlined the central defensive lineup because Pablo Marie is gone, Callum Chambers is gone, Rob Holding is there. And if Arsenal get back into Europe next season, there's going to be a lot more football. It could be Champions League, fingers crossed. I know we've got a long way to go there. But they're getting a player back who is now much more ready for the Premier League than he probably was before this loan to Marseille. And I know he had other loans back and everything else, but there were COVID issues, pandemic issues, some injuries, some personal issues, all of those kinds of things. So I think when when, when that decision was made, people were saying, well, Arteta has written him off. That's it. He doesn't like him. But now we have an Arsenal team that is chock full of young players and Arteta has wedded himself to young players. When we were looking at it thinking, well... He likes Louise and he likes Willie and he doesn't like young players and we've kind of come full circle. So it feels like the Arsenal team that William Saliba will come back into is a much, much better fit for him than the one perhaps that he departed, if you like, um, to go on this loan at Marseille. Yeah, there's quite a lot packed into that. I think There is, um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's all, it's all interesting stuff. I mean, from... From my point of view, having listened to every interview he's, he's given, and he and he you know he's given quite a few because he's he's in demand, and having spoken to him myself, um, I can say that he is he, he sees himself today still as an Arsenal player, and he wants to play for Arsenal, um, which which is really important. I think there's there's history, no question, with Arteta that you know the the, the question mark for me is the relation you know is what Arteta wants, it's, mm. it, and it's whether he. He wants Saliba to be part of um, of Arsenal's future or not, um, but certainly, you know, I was encouraged by by the fact that Saliba sees himself as an Arsenal player because there are a couple of things, you know, to say about his loan deal to to Marseille. You know, first of all, what's really really important for him at this stage in his career, and that's what what he said in the interview that I gave him. Um, or I had with him was that he needs to have a full season at, at the top level because he just hasn't had that. And, mm. you know, he broke through at Saint Etienne at 17 and it's just been so disrupted because of injuries and because of loans and um, issues, let's say, that, that, that perhaps have gone on behind the scenes. Um, 
And he is having that. He is having a really, really full season. Now, fingers crossed he's, he stays fit until the end of it. Um, the other thing that, that people in, in the UK and perhaps around the world who don't watch French football um, don't realise is that it's, it's, it's massive, um, Marseille. It is absolutely massive that it's, it's a pressure bowl of a, of a stadium. Um, you speak to Robert Perez about it. I mean, he, you know, he's, mm. he, he captained a Marseille side that was really struggling and he would be, you know, hounded out of the stadium and, and, and all sorts. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not just a town that lives and breathes football. It's a whole region and it's, you know, the biggest supported club in France. And yes, it's only the French league, but I tell you what, play in front of 67,000 there against Paris Saint-Germain. I was there at, at that game where Saliba was, was superb against Mbappe and, and the others and they got that nil-nil draw and there was that famous tackle from uh, from uh, Saliba on, on Mbappe at the mm. end. But, um, uh, you know, it's it, it's really not easy to, su- to succeed at Marseille and when Saliba says, if I can succeed at Marseille, I can, see- I can succeed anywhere. People, again, people in the UK might read that and go, oh, well, okay, but... The options he had, it seems, in terms of the loan, there was Newcastle. This was pre-Saudi Newcastle. There was Southampton. You know, you're going there maybe without the sort of guarantees. I mean, I don't think he had guarantees at Marseille, but but it, you're going into the unknown somewhat in that it's another English club. You're not sure about the structure, how they're going to use you, what's going to happen. So he's gone to Marseille, obviously, with certain assurances. And, and, and he's absolutely... He's absolutely nailed it. I mean, he's been, you know, he's, he's been he's been superb, and to do that in that environment is is mightily impressive. So you're right. He is he is definitely going to be a much better player, better equipped person um, for the experience at the end of this season. No question. Yeah, there, there, there were some interesting comments. I can't remember if this was in your interview or not, but he said something about how what happened at Arsenal, all the things that happened. You know, it gave him a bit of a slap. I think is what he said. Um, and and maybe having that slap at 19 or 20 and realizing that football is a difficult industry it doesn't come easy even if you're a big name and a club has gone out and paid 28 million pounds for you as a a central defender um you know whether the nuts and bolts of that deal all make sense i don't quite know but you know to to be that level-headed and to realize that okay, sometimes it's not really just about you. It's about the circumstances you find yourself in as a young player and that you have to adjust and you have to you have to work. Um, I, I found that quite encouraging as well. Like the, the, I can understand why he would be frustrated, and I think he said that too. But I can also um, get behind the idea that he was able to compartmentalize that frustration and say, okay, well, look, this is what I'm going to have to do. This is what I want. And this is what, what I'm going to have to do to get there. So it's quite a mature outlook for such a young guy. Yeah, I think he is. I think he is quite mature. He speaks well. Um, the slap in the face, I, I, it wasn't my interview, but I read that mm. as well. Um, I, th- I think, and, and I get what you're saying, but I, I think he, he still probably feels <laughs> a little bit like he, he doesn't understand like why mm. why Arsenal spent that money on him and then didn't you know didn't give him a chance I, I think you know he he said yeah it was a slap in in the face and no but you're right I mean if if if, if he realizes that yeah that is something that you've got to digest and bounce back from then that that has to be positive as well and there's no point mm. dwelling on it and it may feel like he's given loads of interviews and stuff but actually I think he's been pretty coy and uh you know, things 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 get blown up so quickly, and the translations don't always help. Um, yeah, but I, I, you know, I, I I think he's done quite well not to say anything that you know could have seriously done. You know, because I, I think yeah, he could have said things about about Mikel Arteta that clearly you know that probably would have made the situation untenable. Um, because I think he was quite you know hurt quite badly by by what happened. But like mm. I say, he, he wants to play for Arsenal and. Uh, I'd love to see him in an Arsenal shirt. Um, so we'll have to wait and see. All right. Well, look, fingers crossed because, you know, like we've said, the, the positives far outweigh the negatives um, this season in terms of his development as a player, at least. Uh, just one final thing before we go. Um, the striker situation at Arsenal is one which is uh, exercising many people, all of us, I'm sure, who want to see Arsenal with a with a, a good goal scorer up front or a guy who can give us something a bit more up front than, than what we've got right at this moment in time. And the summer is obviously the time when that's going to happen. One of the names who, who, who is being talked about quite regularly is Jonathan David at, at Lille. Um, he's having a pretty decent season, 16 goals in 32 games. Um, 
I know this isn't an in-depth assessment or anything like that, but, you know, having watched him a lot, what, what would you make of him as a potential target for Arsenal this summer? Look, I think he's uh, I think he's a good striker who's at a good age and will get better. Um, he took he, he arrived at Lille last season, took a few months to find his feet, and then played a big part in in them winning the league last season. I think he got eleven or twelve goals in in the second half of the season. He got the winner at, at, at PSG. Um, I just wonder. I mean, he's gonna be he's gonna be a big big money signing for somebody mm. because Lille spent I think close to thirty million euros on him. They won't be selling him for less than half. Sorry, less than double of that, um, given the progression he's had. So we're looking at another big outlay to Leo. I don't know if the Nicola Pepe thing is going to kind of give yeah. people second thoughts. Burn some I just, I, <laughs> I just think in terms of the price tag, I'm not sure he's the sort of complete package that Arsenal want or need. I think he's a he's a good mobile striker, a classy finisher. Probably needs to play off. Um, another attacker. That's the thing. He's, he's done really well with Burak Yilmaz, who's a big, strong Turkish international striker. Um, and I just think in the, in the current Arsenal setup, I'm, I'm just not sure, you know, if I look at Isaac or, or Vlajevic, I think they're perhaps more suited. Um, not that we'll get either, but um, obviously not Vlajevic. But um, yeah, it's, 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 it's hard to say. And I don't want to downplay Jonathan David, but I think if you've got a, a 60, 70 million quid um check that you want to put on a striker I wouldn't necessarily be going for Jonathan David all right okay well look we'll see what happens between now and the end of the season maybe a flurry of goals and what have you might change our minds you never know (laughs) Um, Matt as ever thank you very much indeed great to talk to you pleasure thanks Andrew thank you to Matt you can find him on Twitter at Matt Spiro at Matt Spiro and of course we'll be keeping an eye on Liga to see how it goes for William Saliba between now and the end of the season I did ask Matt uh, after we'd finished Uh, about the reported transfer ban for Marseille because there was some talk that they they would like to sign Saliba on a a permanent basis. They'd like to keep him. uh, And the transfer ban would obviously put paid to that. Matt basically said it's not quite that. There isn't a ban, but he doesn't think that Marseille would be able to necessarily afford Saliba. Uh, And the other thing to take into account here, of course, is that they have Matteo Genduzzi, who they have an obligation to buy for around £10 million at the end of the season based on the loan deal that we did uh, last summer. So that might cut into their uh, transfer uh, funds a little bit. Saliba, a player I hope we bring back because, as I said, he's got basically everything you need in a modern central defender and he's now got a lot more playing experience, first team experience under his belt. And when you look at his age and you consider how much more he can develop, in the years to come, let's hope it is at Arsenal. I hope that Mikel Arteta sees a place for him in a squad which ideally will have European football next season and will need depth in in all our positions. We like what Gabriel and Ben White could become and have been this season, but let's not kid ourselves that you know they can play every game together. So we do need more, and I hope Saliba is the man who can provide that. Right, I'm going to leave it there for now. Obviously, we're playing Brentford uh, on Saturday tomorrow. Friday as you're listening to this if you are listening on Friday of course but we will dig into that game a bit more over on Patreon our Patreon preview podcast will be out tomorrow late tomorrow afternoon early tomorrow evening Lewis is not around Phil Costa will be stepping into the breach we'll discuss Brentford Mikel Arteta's press conference is tomorrow morning as well so we'll have a bit more information a bit more on the game fitness news injury news all that kind of stuff we'll do it over on Patreon patreon.com forward slash arsblog for now Take it easy. Thank you as ever for listening, and we will catch you on the next one. Until then, cheers. Bye-bye. Arsenal comes streaming forward now in surely what will be their last attack. A good ball by Dixon, finding Smith.
for Thomas, charging through the midfield. Thomas, it's up for grabs now. Thomas, right at the end. An unbelievable climax to the league season. Well into injury time, the Liverpool players are down absolutely abject. And the Arsenal fans remain seated, of course, a smattering of polite applause. I can see a couple of perfunctory handshakes there. They do not want to celebrate, lest they upset anybody. And you have to say, that really is the way it should be. There is no place in football for joy.